Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this virtual pre-concert talk. We've got a, um, just a wonderful lineup of music for this program that's all about love. This Our season is uh, has a theme that is love, and this love is the love that we as an organization have experienced from this community that has supported us so strongly in good times and in challenging times with COVID and et cetera. It's the love that we have of certain pieces and um, composers that have helped catapult us to this exciting 20th anniversary moment. It's the love of that exists between the performers in making music together and, and just the all coming together as, as one big family, the true Concord family. Uh, and so it's it's fitting that this concert, which is called "This Is How You Love," is is all about love, and it's it's kind of the many moods of love. Um, I'm really looking forward to reintroducing everyone to Tim and Jocelyn, our composers in residence, about their piece uh, from which we get the title of this concert, "This Is How You Love." But we do begin with a couple of gems: Eric Whitaker's five Hebrew love songs. And Brahms' first set of love songs, his Liebeslieder waltzes. And I'm joined by uh, our managing director, Wells. Hey, Wells, how you doing? Hey, Eric, doing great, thanks. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. And um, I know you know so much about music and you have such eclectic taste. I, you know, there are lots of opinions about Eric Whitaker's music. We have performed a lot of his pieces. Um, and it's not universally loved, but it is safe to say that in the main, he has, um, he's he's had this reputation of being a choral rock star. He works primarily in the in the choral realm, but um, and, and again, we've done a number of pieces because I think they're really outstanding. And and you must have had some experiences along the way with with Eric's music, that Wells. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. I think there's always in the classical music world, whether it's people who are practitioners of it or audience members. There's a built-in suspicion of anything that's popular <laughs> that somehow it must be terrible because, you know, this was actually Gershwin's problem in many mm. ways. And I'm not trying to say Eric is George, but there is that issue that comes up every once in a while. The thing about Eric is that he does write fantastically well um, for chorus. So does Skip Lordson, you know, so does Stephen Paulus. I mean, the, the, there are these amazing composers that have a gift for this specialty and it is a specialty um, but Eric is definitely one of them. In addition, um, I know everybody here in Tucson loves our classical radio station. And uh, one of the most popular and listened to classical radio stations in the world is in the UK, Classical FM. And they named Eric one of the 10 composers to watch of the 21st century. Yeah, so I believe it. You don't, one doesn't do that lightly. You know, you're sort of hanging yourself out there um, with an opinion, but it's how people feel. And I I think it's really exciting when people feel so strongly. First of all, anybody suspicious is going to take a more jaundiced eye at any new work, and they're going to sort of try to see what they don't like about it. And then they're going to be usually, you know, overwhelmed by its beauty because he does write beautiful music. Um, and I'm thrilled that you chose this piece of his um, to do on this program. It's perfect. Well, it, it fits in so well, and it, it, and there's a beautiful story behind it. Um, so Eric um, and his girlfriend at the time, Hila Plitman, who herself is a, just a world class artist, and extraordinary, I've had the really good fortune of of working with her on a on a project that we did with the Tucson Desert Song Festival a few years ago, and she is Grammy nominated. She may have even won a Grammy, I, I'm, if I recall correctly, uh, as a performer, but. Eric had asked Hila, his girlfriend at the time, to write some poetry, and he wanted it in her native tongue. So she was she was born in Jerusalem, and she wrote these short little Hebrew uh, poems um, that really encapsulate their their love at the time and and some of their very intimate experiences together in in their relationship. And so I think it's really cool, and we're going to talk to to Jocelyn and Tim in a moment about, you know, how, you know, a couple work together in creating something. I think it's, I think it's fascinating, but here Gila wrote the words and, and Eric set them to music and they're just, they're really exquisite and, and 
um, sweet and and powerful in their emotion. Definitely. Yeah, it's a great it's a great um, matching piece to the other two things that you've programmed for this particular set of concerts. And so we open with the Whitaker and it sets the tone, I think, beautifully. It's chorus and piano and violin. And then we move to Brahms. And I I know you have been around these pieces a lot, Wells. And the first time I met you, you were playing these pieces on a program here with the Tucson Desert Song Festival. Um, and there's just something um, so special about these pieces. I mean, we think about Brahms, we tend to think of his symphonies and or the Requiem, but he wrote these love songs, you know, to be, to be performed by you know regular singers in somebody's home and 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 just it, it's it's like house music um um on a, on a real intimate level yeah it's it's the definition if you were to look up salon music in webster's dictionary you'd have a little picture of brahms the yeah. the thing that differentiates him so much and there are lots of things from the whitaker selection and jocelyn and tim's piece is that he was in love with someone who could never actually respond to him. That at least is the, the general theory. Um, and many people know this tragic story. Robert Schumann and Clara were responsible for, in many ways for Brahms's career, along with a critic that came around the, the bend. And as Robert Schumann slowly sunk into mental illness and madness, Brahms was the one that would go visit him in the asylum. Um, because it was too much for Clara, which is not an unusual thing for a spouse to be unable to do that. She was also, with Liszt, the most famous pianist in the world and a composer in her own right. Brahms was infatuated with her in all the right ways, not a stalker. He truly was in love with her, but he knew he could never cross that line. These songs, I wouldn't say delve in these, these waltzes, you know, but by their very nature, waltzes don't delve into the deep necessarily all that in a big way, right? Though if anything does, it's these and Steve Sondheim's Little Night Music. Those are waltzes and maybe the Ravel. Um, but this was a moneymaker for him too. He did very well, very lucrative for him. And that always makes me happy when a composer makes money in their own, in their own lifetime. Um, and you can see him in those those drawings of him with the cigar and playing the piano. Right. Um, and they are charming, but I, I would use that word delicately because charming can also sound saccharine. And that's mm -hmm. not what these are. Just yeah. as they start to veer into saccharine, like his symphonies, like his songs, like um, oh, those beautiful serenades or the alto rhapsody or any number of things, when he starts to go over that edge into maybe more sweetness than you expect, he pulls back. And these do that as well. And I know that audiences, they told me that they love it when you program these pieces and they're really looking forward to it. So these three works, completely different. Love story, love story, not so much love story, right? But but powerful at the same time. And sometimes unrequited love can be ever bit as powerful and as meaningful, right, yeah. to a human being. So. Yeah. And Brahms was was so proud of, of these pieces. Uh, at least he expressed that to his publisher. And I, I think it's because they were so intensely personal. I mean, he had exactly. these 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 powerful feelings and, you know, unrequited love is is it is a powerful thing oh. to grapple with. Yeah. And, and he but these aren't depressing songs. These, these no, no. No. And you use the word charming and, and all the, the right ways. Um, but they they speak, I think, to our to our our experiences. Yeah, I, I think in, in many ways, his use of forehand piano allows for um, the, the instrumentalist, the, the two pianists to do something that veers almost into darkness, but doesn't quite go there. And and some of the solo songs are just knockout gorgeous, like you can't right. believe. I mean, you would think he would use it in other pieces, right? In bigger pieces. Right. You know, as beautiful as the soprano solo in the Requiem, I mean, is there anything as beautiful as that? I don't know. But, you know, getting there, he knew how to write a tune. There's no question about that. Um, so I think people are really going to love this program. And, and you speak so eloquently about True Concord's love for the Tucson community. Um, I would also say um, George Balanchine, who was no slouch when it came to selecting music that he set to dance, set these songs. 
Yeah. And if you think about you think of Balanchine, you think of, you know, some of the craggy, more challenging Stravinsky works. Right. And and of course, there's a nutcracker and things like that, too. But this this says something about the weightiness of it. And yet it doesn't weigh one down when you listen to them, especially to be performed by True Conquer. No, truly, I, I I find them quite uplifting, um, and 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 the the fact that there are two pianists and um, you know a, a, a relatively small choir, I think it 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 captures in a way the original essence of of Brahms's intention to to have this be real accessible, to be have it to be personal, um, and so everybody can feel a part of it. Uh, yeah. It's it's it, it's that true concord thing again. Everybody together in in experiencing um, the ups and downs and the various moods and aspects of love. Absolutely right. There's a there's a, a tremendous intimacy, and sometimes when we think about intimacy, intimacy, we think of small and a few people or a couple or something like this. This is intimacy on the level of him exposing himself. Oh yeah, as a man in love. Yep, that's true. And Johannes we look forward to. Yes. Yep, exactly. We look forward to sharing um, these love songs, the Hebrew, uh, five Hebrew love songs of Whitaker, and the incredible journey that um, our composers in residence, Tim and Jocelyn, take us on in their This Is How You Love. Um, so lots, lots to love here. Well, hey guys, it's really great to see you. Good to see you too, Eric. <laughs> Jocelyn Hagen, Tim Takash, our first ever composers in residence. In your second year now. That's right, year two. Yep. I mean, when I just think about the highlights so far, I mean, I, about a year ago, we gave the Southwest premiere of Helios with brand new visuals. That was just completely spectacular. Yes. And then just this past January, we finally gave <laughs> the world premiere of Here I Am, which people are still talking about. It was an incredible piece, um, very impactful collaboration with the Tucson Girls Chorus. It was a long time in coming, but Jocelyn, we finally did it Yay. and uh, <laughs> with with great acclaim. So so thank you to you both. And now this year. Well, first of all, we're going to be reprising. I'm very excited about reprising your notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci come January. But we're doing something incredibly interesting, unusual, and unique that I can't wait to talk with you about. It's a piece that you wrote together called This Is How You Love. In fact, this is such a striking piece. We were calling the concert This Is How You Love. And frankly, it's just been central to our whole theme of our season, which is all about love and the love of true concord for this community that has catapulted us to this incredible 20th anniversary moment. It's the love of our artists and composers like you and pieces that have been so meaningful along this 20 year journey. And so I'm, I'm just thrilled that we're doing this piece and I have so many questions, but let, let's start with, how did you come up with this idea of this is how you love and 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 how did you decide to write it together and how do you write a piece together? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, well, it, it was a commission <laughs> from a choir called the Esoterics out in Seattle. And he was very excited about commissioning us together, mm -hmm. which at that point, had we done before? I don't think so, no. We, we hadn't done. So since this piece, we have collaborated again and written more pieces together, which is really fun. But um, that was new because actually in the early stages of our careers and even mid stages of our careers, we did not advertise the fact that we were married. We kind of kept it under wraps. You know, I kept my maiden name professionally. And um, although on my license, it says Jocelyn Hagen to cash. Um, oh. But we wanted to have separate entities. And so actually when this request came through to have us write music together, um, it was like, oh, I, I feel like the cat's gonna be out of the bag. If <laughs> <do it." laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was a that was a big decision to 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 like talk about it. Cause I think that the piece is is one thing as a collaborative venture, but with it being about love and about a relationship or relationships. It, it has a deeper meaning, the fact that 
we're together and wrote it. And so like, there's just a lot of layers there. Um, and the, the idea that Eric Banks had with the esoterics um, was to model it after, um, was it a uh, song of songs? Oh yeah. Like the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sort of like a, a, a biblical inspiration. Yep. And we, we sort of used that as a starting point and then moved in our own direction and, and found the idea of talking about, I think maybe even the next step was talking about marriage. And then we thought, well, let's just talk about being together in general and what that's like. And so um, we, we knew right away that we wanted to have ups and downs. It wasn't just all roses and flowers and chocolates, but it, it was like, a, we wanted it to be a real uh, portrayal of what it's like to be in a, a relationship like that. For sure. And as I read through these texts, and, and I'm, I, I'd love for you to um, let us know how you selected these texts, but you're, you're absolutely right. We get the gamut of emotions that any of us who've been in intimate relationships experience. The ups and downs, as, as you've said, you know, the, the real highs, well, the good times and the bad times mm -hmm. is, our, is our vows state, right? Mm -hmm. um, how did you go about... Um, assembling these texts and and particularly the the texts that are excerpts from marriage counseling sessions yeah you found those i think, I think so yeah, yeah I, I can't remember uh exactly if, if i was looking for that or or how i can't remember how that came about but i i had um i had ordered a book that was uh basically a, about therapy and I, I had contacted the author of that and said can I use some of your transcripts? Because she'd already gotten the rights to publish these transcripts anonymously for her book. And so she said, it's really easy for me just to grant you that same permission. Um, so so then, so I contacted her first and then bought the book and then just went through and, and picked out passages and conversations that seemed really uh, impactful and important to the narrative. But as far as the poetic uh, part of the libretto, we basically just cast a wide net between the two of us and pulled in as many poems as we thought would be useful and then sat down together and just sort of thumbed through them all and, and put them in different orders and thought, well, these two could be really nice next to each other. And um, originally, um, very early in the process, we decided to take gender out of the out of the equation as far as who these poems were about. So they're all in first and second person. It's I and you and we. Yeah. Um, and I think it's it's a, a neat moment to, to make it about everybody and about anybody at the same time. That's yeah. really cool. So I'm, you guys have a, obviously a, a really fantastic relationship. Every time around you just, I know, you seem to just really work well together as a team. And But certainly there have been disagreements about, okay, no. this text versus that. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, how do you work out these, you know, you're putting together a libretto. We haven't gotten to the music part yet, which I'm dying to talk about, but... Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, how did you sort this out in terms, you know, it was here's my list, here's your list now. How do we how do we do this? Yeah, I feel like the libretto came together pretty easily. The biggest issues we had with the libretto is that we couldn't get the rights to all the poems that we wanted. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we ended up commissioning a few um, to fill in like, oh, OK, so now we have a hole here and we need this type of poem. And so then we commissioned yeah. that. Which were the ones we commissioned? Do you remember? Yeah, it was. Um... It was, did we get one from Julia? We we commissioned Endurance mm -hmm. and then, uh, was it Love Song of Empty Spaces or was that already oh, in Was it this one? Leave the Lights Off. That might I have think been that's it. the yeah, one 3 from Julia. That's yeah. a good one. Mm -hmm. That's a really good one. Uh, but we had the, we had, at that point we had the narrative of the piece. And so when we couldn't get rights to certain texts, we were, we went, we were able to go to poets and say, this is the moment we need to fill. Can you fill it? Yeah. I think maybe Bill Reichert's poem, Too Hungry, oh, was yeah. a commission Which poem. is such a great poem. Yeah. They're all really great texts, but there's, can you talk about the arc of the of the text? Because I feel like um, you're telling a story. In fact, I was talking to Kathy Birch at, at the Arizona Daily Star um, just yesterday, and she says, she asked me, is this a true story? That was mm -hmm. an interesting question, right? Yeah. Oh, I think there's a lot of truth in it. You know, mm -hmm. it feels like it kind of takes you through what a relationship, how, how it kind of begins. You know, I love that it starts with a vow. So like the beginning mm -hmm. of a, yeah. 
hey, we're we're entering into this together and we care about each other. And then, you know, it's not perfect. You, you know, yeah. little things come up and it's kind of like, oh, but I still love you. You know, it kind of has that. And then there is that moment of, of deep conflict, which, you know, I think every marriage, I think if it didn't have that, I'd actually be worried, you know, that there right. are moments where, you know, there's really something you have to endure together. And, um, and so, yeah, we, we only got mad at each other a few times, <laughs> <laughs> the writing of the piece, but it, I love that we did. Yeah. Like it's in there. It just made sense. Know. It is in the piece. Mm -hmm. Um, well, it is because there's, there's a, there's a set of texts and it comes from the marriage counseling excerpt where it says, are you angry with me? <laughs> and, yeah. and, and then there's this back and forth. So tell us more about that. Well, I think when we when we found those um, those conversations and those disclosures, um, we we wanted them to be very intimate and very real. You asked if it's a true story, and it's the whole thing is not, but all these moments are, especially the the actual transcripts of couples therapy. Like yeah. that did actually happen to somebody. Not mm -hmm. they're not all the same people in this one piece, but they are all truths and they are all real. So. Um, we wanted those moments to be very intimate and very direct. And so to, to score them for just two voices singing in each other more in conversation, almost like a recit, um, made a lot of sense. And some of those end up being underscored with choir, but mostly they're just two voices. And again, we wanted to be very um, inclusive as far as not assigning gender or voice parts to any any of those folks. So whoever can sing those notes can sing that that role. Um, but I feel like the disclosures probably most most consistently offer the most uh, friction in in this story, you know. And then the the poetic choices again most often uh, offer some sort of of togetherness and sort of um, a makeup. <laughs> yeah. So so to be clear, then the the construction of the piece for the for the benefit of the audience is you've got choral passages throughout the work, and then interspersed are these. Um, these these little conversations, if you will, and and they're scored for just two voices, and as you mentioned, they could be any voice type. Um, so, how did you decide? You know how you were going to. I mean, did you start with the disclosures, so the the conversations, and mm -hmm. then work the other poetry around them, or was it the other way around? Or as far as writing the music or the libretto? Well, the libretto. Yeah, I I think I think we had the poems first. And then maybe uh, source the disclosures to sort of bridge bridge the gap between one larger movement and the next. I honestly can't remember back way back yeah. then. I know we when we wrote the music, we started with the the more full choral movements, and I think we wrote the disclosures toward the end of the process. Yeah, to kind of fit in and maybe even serve as a bit of a transition. Yeah, and key key relationships and things like that. Well, what what is the so you said that it's 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 not an actual story, but there's so much truth in it. What is the story you want to tell with this music and this piece? I, I mean, I think that that the the truth is that a, a good relationship and a healthy relationship is made up of all these things. Yeah, and it, and it's all about the balance, and it's about being able to communicate the ways that you're frustrated so that you can come around afterwards and, and see things from the same viewpoint. Um, and I think we'd be lying if we said that's not a part of, of it all. So it's it, it feels complete to me. I feel like we, we talk about all these different aspects of relationship in in one piece. And I think just the, the, the acceptance of that, the reality is that it feels important to me. Yeah. Yeah, like I, I, I know one of the things that I think a lot of people would maybe tiptoe around or, or think it's hard to to sing about or talk about is the um, the physical intimacy movement, which is hungry. And Tim wrote that one on his own. And um, I just, I absolutely love that movement. And it's, it's so, it's so beautiful and thoughtful and, you know, kind of sexy. And you, there's not many opportunities that we have in choral music to explore that one. Mm -hmm. I also really enjoy the, the final movement anniversary because I feel it like it does encapsulate all of that in one poem where where the, the poet Philip Alpman is saying, like, 
we thought it would be all violins and roses and yet it's it wasn't strange to find drums and cymbals where we thought they'd be really beautiful like there's a percussive element there and there's a, there's friction and there's clamorous noises and it's, it's not what you think it is and that's that's all part of it and and even so we're, we're ready to move on like we we acknowledge all that and we embrace it well, what I loved about that last poem is that after all of these ups and downs and the, you know, the, you know, the going through the hungry and, and, and the angry and all that, there is a, a message of, I don't know, it, it, an eternal quality of love and, and that which, you know, is, is always there. It's like the tie that binds through, through all of it or something. It, 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 it ends on a, just a really, I don't know, promising, affirming, uplifting, note yeah yeah that it's all all worth it right. you know yeah. It, it, yeah. That it is tough and you worth have to it. stick it out and um yeah but if you if you can make it work it uh uh it's really a beautiful thing to be a part of i love that and it, it is it is quite a journey that that we go through with this piece so l let's let's talk about the music i mean the words you know you start with the words as as Good composers do and then and then it's a matter of sending these words that already have so much emotion in them and how do you set those words and capture those emotions in music and now there's two of you so how do you divvy this up is it you take that movement i'll take this movement or you know i'll, I'll do these bars you do those bars or how, how, how does that work <laughs> well we we decided at the beginning, since there were so many movements and it's a big piece, that let's try all the different ways that we could make this. So we did the thing where we just have manuscript paper on the piano and like one of us would write a little and then the other one would come and write a little, but not together, really? kind of a back and forth. So that was one way. Um, we also did sitting at the piano just together mm -hmm. and what that was like. Um, I really love the partner songs that we did, which is where um, there are two poems, so two complete songs that stand on their own, and then you put them together, and it's just, it's really magical, I think. So there are two of those partner songs in there, and we did it so um, we each got a chance to go first. Um, so, because that second one is always... Um, you know, you have to fit within the counterpoint of the other song, which is a really great compositional challenge. Mm -hmm. And so uh, those were some of my favorite composing moments were those. And that's also where we fought <laughs> was in the partner song. And the, <laughs> I think one of the, the other things that we did too, is you talking about moving from the libretto to music. We, we would take one of these poems, two copies of it. We'd both go to a different corner and sort of just sketch out on the page, how we thought the architecture of that piece could be based on the poem. And then we'd come back and compare notes. And, and um, I think we did that for a couple of them and they were always pretty clearly um, equal as far as like our ideas. It's like, oh yeah, we're seeing the structure the same way, which I think makes a lot of sense because we spend so much time working with poems. And then it was a matter of like, well, I've, I've got a great musical idea for this section right here or this line. Um, and the other person would say, well, I've got a great idea here. And so one of those ended up being like a relay race where it's like, okay, you, you write these first two lines and then give it to me and I'll write the next section. And then this section after that feels like it should be the same music as the beginning. So we'll give it back to you and you can write mm -hmm. that. And then we'll see what goes like. So just passing it off back and forth. And to the same extent, that's how the partner songs worked where somebody went first and wrote their one minute partner song and then gave that music to the second person. And they wrote the second song to fit within all that, that space that was left over. Well, I, this is so intriguing to me, um, especially the idea um, you, you, you say that, you know, you'd start it to write a few, a few measures and then, and then the other one would come and sort of pick up from there. And I mean, what, what would you do if you sat down on the piano? You're like, yeah, I don't, I don't think he, he's got that just right. <laughs> well, yeah. We left some room in there for, we, we didn't want it to be so sacred that we couldn't give each other feedback because I think that's the that's the real benefit of a collaborative relationship, right? Is that one plus one equals three. And if you if you stay on your side of the court exclusively, you won't get that. And so the the ability for us to, to sort of cross over and say, I'm not I don't understand what's happening here, or 
I think this this doesn't drive emotionally enough for this next section or you know whatever the the feedback was the we and the piece benefited from being able to do that um so but in the partner songs we had said okay well whoever goes first um write your thing and that that'll be sacred we'll, we won't touch that and then the second person will come in and sort of fill in the gaps because i think in any sort of situation like that especially even if even if you're um if you're like a singer songwriter and you're writing your own text and the music sometimes you'll write the text you'll start the music and then the music will say oh this text isn't actually quite right for this music so i'm gonna go back and change the text mm -hmm. and, then the, and then what you change ends up changing the music and it can go back and forth like that and if nothing is sacred you could just go back and forth forever mm -hmm. so for the partner songs we thought okay let's have that first song be sacred and then the next person was right in but that's where we fought is because i had gone first and turned mine into jocelyn mm -hmm. And then we played through them together. And I said, I think something's wrong here. This note, this isn't right. And she said, oh, yeah, I changed that. And I was like, you did what? <laughs> well, I, did. I feel like it was different because it was an omission. Like I just took something <laughs> as opposed to actually like changing a note. It was just, yeah. I'm just going to take that out. Because it's the same if you take something out. You're not changing anything. Let, let, let it out the guys. third of my chord you know like musically the third of the chord is kind of important it gives it some character <laughs> and it was gone i said wait a second that, when it's my turn to have my song sung alone that's not the moment that i want she goes well it didn't work for me i was like okay <laughs> and so we, you know i we we just sort of sat there like this at the piano like both looking straight ahead like in silence <laughs> and i was like well, i guess i mean i was like i'll I'll go back and I'll you were the martyr. I'll rewrite yeah. my piece. And she said, okay. And she hopped up and left. <laughs> All right, we'll I, I, was, I was confident that what that you'd be able to find something else that was just as good, that you were just as happy with, that also fit together with this idea. Because what I what I really cared about was at this climactic moment that his chord together with my chord together made a new chord that where it doesn't feel like either of them. It, it felt like something different. And so to do that, it, it was a, it was a challenge to figure out what that chord could be. And I, and I thought I came up with a pretty brilliant solution. So I just decided to go with it. Yeah. <laughs> well, obviously you made it work. And I, I mean, talk about collaboration, but also talk about just maybe, you know, a little test of your relationship. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, you know, I mean, because certainly you, you can't just walk away from the piano or the music and, and then it's, it's, it's over, right? And you're going to cook dinner and, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, how do you, you can't really separate. Right. That yeah. Stuff, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, um, <laughs> there was also one day when we were fighting about something else, like, <laughs> something stupid like that had to do with the kids or the house or the, something stupid. And we had, we would set up dates in our, in our calendar to be like, okay, you know, at 2 PM, we have a, we have a date to write some music. And it got to that time that day. And I was just like, I can't work with you right now. <laughs> <Man>. <laughs> we need to reschedule. Yeah. <laughs> well, because you know, there are moments in life where, you know, you just, well, also going back to the other one where you need to stand your ground. Like, no, this is, I believe in this so much that I, I really can't let go. Like this, this is a, a yeah. moment I am going to, you know, yeah. stay. Well, and also like the, the process of creating something and, and throwing ideas at the wall and seeing what sticks is very vulnerable, right? Like you're, you're at your most vulnerable because you're, you're, you don't know what these things are and to have somebody next to you and share those half-baked things with somebody who who may or may not judge those ideas for more than they should be worth, that's a vulnerable place. So if, if you're feeling closed off or if you're feeling like, I don't want to share anything with this person, it's not going to work. It won't happen. So yeah. you, you have to be in a very good place here so so that you're willing to, to experiment and share some things and you're willing to receive feedback. You're ready to give feedback in a constructive way right. uh, it all it all has to line up and so if one of those things is off it's like let's just let's just wait a day and we'll come back tomorrow when we're more ready to do this feedback in a constructive but loving way right but loving mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yep i i don't want to turn this into a, a a marriage counseling session but i mean i'm just curious having gone through this process what did it did it 
did it have an impact on your on your relationship? I mean, did it bring you just a sense of being closer and and a, a deeper appreciation of each other's um, compositional art form? I think I, I mean I don't appreciate her art any more than I've already I did. <laughs> Like, wait, just wait for it. Wait for the whole sentence, Austin. I don't appreciate that. Yeah, you just, just wait. Just clip out that one part, and that'll be your promotion for the thing. That's the quote, <laughs> right? Like, I didn't, I, what I did gain, though, is a, is a further understanding of, of how her brain works, which is still yeah. much a mystery to me. But her <laughs> compositional brain is something where when I hear her finished product, I think, how did she do that? How did she arrive yeah. at and that, like, what were the decisions? And yeah. having done this, I have a little bit more of a window into that. It's it's still kind of a mystery, but I I get it a little bit more. And so that was that was fun to be that close to her creative process through that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. It was fun to be that close to yours and to realize, you know, it, it, because you know you're in the nitty gritty of everything with with notes and counterpoint and rhythms, and you start to see just, oh yeah, that's why it sounds like you. You know, it's just a little bit of a th more thorough, detailed analysis of of what's happening there. And um, so that was that was fun to get to know you in that way, just a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what I love thinking about with this piece too, is that I think it's successful because we are naturally good at collaborating with each other. Mm -hmm. Like, really? and, and a work sense, because, you know, like many married couples, we also have kids and that's the thing. But, you know, we started a publishing company together the year we got married, you know? And so we've been collaborating on, on that kind of work for a long time. And so it actually, I was worried. I was more worried about this than he was. Mm -hmm. I was really scared that it would not go well because I know that there are times when I would want to stick and be you know, yeah. I'm an only child <laughs> and I, and I like, I like that level of control that I can have over, over the music. So, um, I was much more nervous walking into this project than Tim was. Um, but it, over the process of it, I realized, oh yeah, this is working. And it's because I really trust you. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate your music and think it's beautiful and oh. yeah. And do I have a third? Probably not. Probably not. It just you feels can, good. To you can stop it. after how beautiful my music is. <laughs> <laughs> Shame on you. <laughs> yeah. So that that is really beautiful. Um, uh, this this piece that you did together and the journey that you took together and that we get to be part of as uh, the performers, but also our audience. Have you done it again? Will you do it again? Are there other projects that you're thinking about writing together? Yeah, mm -hmm. there's there's things on the horizon that we're <laughs> gonna do that we're thinking about doing that it'll it'll happen again. We we did um uh, two years ago we wrote a, a shorter like choral octavo for choir and forehand piano and that was fun because we kind of divided it in half the the long way. So I took all the choral parts and she took all the piano parts and we just sort of glued those together. Um, which is kind of a lot of fun to do. Yeah. Wow. Cool. I, I'm I'm impressed, intrigued, and and just really excited about sharing this really beautiful collaboration and music with with our audiences on this program that is that is all about love. Thank you. And um, I'm also excited that after each of our concerts, we get to hang out on stage, and folks can um, grab a cookie and ask you some questions because I'm thinking that this conversation and then hearing the piece itself will generate some, some more intrigue and questions on the part of our audience. And so we get to open up this conversation to everybody and um, invite all who are watching now to, to come and, and hear this incredible music, stick around and, and join in the conversation after the program. So thank you, Tim and Jocelyn for doing this, for sharing this music, for sharing this incredible relationship you have uh, with us. And we're just so thrilled and proud um, to have you as our composers in residence. So thank you. Thank you. We're, we're really looking forward to it. Yeah, same for us. We love coming down to Tucson and yeah. working with you all. So grateful. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see you soon. Sounds good. Bye. Bye-bye.